Such a gift. Billy, love you, man. I don't think I could rock those boots, but you can, man. That's awesome. That's awesome. My name is Christian. I'm one of the, hey, thank you. Um, I'm one of the pastors and elders here. I get the opportunity to open up God's word with you today. And I got to say, this is a fuller house than we've had at any time in January, which is pretty great. Thank the Lord, it seems like that the, the, the crest of the wave has passed, and it's so good to be back with so many of you uh, today, and also to all of our family that are, that are watching online. It's a pleasure to be able to have you join us remotely as well. We're going to be continuing our series in the book of First Thessalonians. So if you have a Bible, go ahead and open up. We'll be looking at chapter 2. Verses 1 through 12 today. We've got some Bibles. We've got some guys who would love to put a Bible in your hands if you need one. You can just throw your hand up. Otherwise, if you want to watch it on your phone, I'll have a lot of the text up on the uh, slides, up on the screens here as well. But I just want to I mention one thing to you guys. As we continue, where this is week three of our series in First Thessalonians, we'll be finishing that up right about Easter time, and then hopefully starting Second Thessalonians right after that. And if you haven't already started to, I would encourage you during this springtime as we're in these two books, Take time to read them or listen to them repeatedly. The nice thing about both of these letters is that they're rather short. You can read them in one sitting if you, if you uh, want to. You could listen to them on your drive to work, things like that. There's, there's five chapters in 1 Thessalonians, three chapters in 2 Thessalonians. That's eight total, which means even if you do a chapter a day and then double up one day, every week you can go through both of these books. And the benefit of that, that repeated reading, listening, meditating on God's word, is that not only will you have to take my word for it or Todd's word for it, but through your own acquaintance and familiarity with God's word, you will see connections. You will catch the main themes. You will be able to join in the conversation, whether talking with the people in your house, your community group, and so forth. Um, I would highly recommend that to you. One of the things that's remarkable about 1 Thessalonians is that Paul spends more than half of the book recapping. The first three chapters are basically all a recap of his history with the Thessalonians. So, so in some ways, the first half of the book is really, it's like, it's like the previously on segment at the beginning of a TV show, where it's like, okay, remember what happened in the past, because you're going to need to know that to understand what's coming ahead. And so over the first three chapters of this book, Paul basically just says, okay, here's our shared history together. As Todd walked us through chapter one, by and large, Paul's emphasis in, in that chapter is, here's what we saw in you, Thessalonians. When we came and we brought the gospel, we saw it come to life. And not only that, we're hearing about your faith from other people, even in this time that we've been apart. What we're going to look at here in chapter 2, verses 1 through 12, is where Paul shifts the focus from what he saw in the Thessalonians to what the Thessalonians saw in him. You remember what you saw in me and in Silas and Timothy when we came through. Then in chapter, thir uh, chapter 2, verse 13, he shifts the focus back for a second to, okay, then after what you saw in us, here's again what we saw in you, the way you received God's word, and you began to grow in your faith even in the midst of difficulty. And then basically the majority of chapter 3 is Paul addressing their time apart. I had to leave abruptly. I didn't want to leave. I wanted to get back. I kept trying to get back, and so far I haven't been able to. So that's why I sent Timothy to you, to check on you, to see how you're doing. And then Timothy came back, and he brought the report, and that's why I'm writing you this letter. Does that make sense? And then in the rest of the book, he kind of gives them some instruction and some encouragement. He's saying, okay, kind of until I get back with you, here are some things that I want you to know so that you can continue to grow in your faith. And I thought Todd did such a great job last week of really framing this for us, that the purpose of this letter, by and large, is to reshape our perspectives, to help us see things differently. That's what Paul's doing for the Thessalonians. They're in the midst of suffering. They're in the midst of, you know, even if it wasn't out and out like physical persecution, they're being separated and ostracized from their family. They don't fit in their culture anymore. There's this, this, this separation and isolation that they're feeling. And he's going, okay, if you're wondering what God's doing in all of this, where he's at in the uncertainty of your circumstances, take a step back with me, get the bigger perspective, remember what God has done so that way you understand what he's doing now because in that way there is so much room for joy and hope even in the midst of that difficulty. And so what we're gonna do, we're gonna dive in here in chapter two, verse one. As Paul shifts that focus from here's what we saw in you Thessalonians to here's what you saw in us. Look what he says here in chapter two, verses one and two. For you yourselves know, brothers, that our coming to you was not in vain. But though we had already suffered and been shamefully treated at Philippi, as you know, 
We had boldness in our God to declare to you the gospel of God in the midst of much conflict. He says it wasn't a waste of time. We didn't waste your time or our time. When we came to you, it was not in vain. You know how we were suffering and shamefully treated in Philippi. Does anybody know what he's talking about there? What happened to Paul and Silas during their time in Philippi, right before he came to Thessalonica? Again, Paul, uh, Todd mentioned this a couple of times, but in the book of Acts, chapter 16 and 17, it refers to this very period of Paul's ministry, how Paul comes to the city of Philippi first, and he begins preaching the gospel, and yet there's this slave girl who has a demon who could tell people's fortunes. Okay, I can't do the math on how all of that worked, but basically as Paul and Silas go through the town preaching the gospel, this girl is trailing behind them, constantly calling out, these men are servants of the most high God who are declaring to you the way of salvation. True message? Yeah. But it got really annoying after several days, right? It says Paul got highly annoyed by this after several days, and he finally turns around and looks at the girl. He casts out the demons. And rather than it be a cause for joy that this image bearer of God had been freed from demonic oppression, her masters, her owners, only see her as a cash cow that's gone dry. We can't make money off of her anymore. And they get really mad at Paul and Silas, so they they drag them before the rulers and they say, these men are advocating customs that are against Roman law. They're saying things that we cannot accept. And the rulers, without even verifying or even checking Paul's like identification, order Paul and Silas to be beaten and thrown in jail, which was a gigantic no-no to do to somebody who's a Roman citizen like Paul was. And while they're in the jail that night, you probably may be more more familiar with this story, there's an earthquake. And all the doors of the jail are opened and the, the jailer wakes up, somehow slept through the earthquake or maybe the earthquake woke him up. He opens his eyes, he sees that all the jail doors are open. He figures everybody's left. I know what I need to do. I need to kill myself, make it look like I died in this escape attempt. Otherwise, if my bosses come and find me alone in the jail, I'll be killed by them and my family will be shamed because I failed at my duty. And he's about to kill himself and then Paul says, hold on a second, we're all here. We didn't leave. And long story short, Paul begins to share the gospel with this jailer. The jailer takes him home, binds their wounds. Paul shares the gospel with his family. They all come to know Jesus and they get baptized that night. And in the morning, the rulers of the town, they basically come with their tail between their legs and go, hey, so uh, we looked into it a little bit more. We realized we beat a Roman citizen. Um, that's a, that could really get us in trouble. So can we just keep this between us? Can you just like nicely leave town? And so Paul and Silas agree, they move on, and the very next place they come is Thessalonica. They come into Thessalonica, and that's where Paul goes, look, you remember what happened to us in Philippi, and you know that when we came to you, the situation didn't get much better. We began to preach the gospel, we were in the synagogue, we were around town, and eventually, the Jews who didn't believe got jealous of the Jews who did believe, and so they tried to do the same thing that happened in Philippi. They tried to drag us before the rulers of town, but they didn't find them. They couldn't find Paul and Barnabas, Barnabas, Silas. They couldn't find Paul and Silas. So they grabbed the next best thing. They grabbed this guy, Jason, who was the guy that, that was hosting Paul and Silas in his house. They drag him in front of the rulers. They make him pay a fine. And at that point, the believers in, in Thessalonica say, hey, Paul and Silas, it might be good to move on. And so Paul and Silas move on to Berea and they continue to preach. They continue to church plant and they continue to suffer for the gospel. Paul goes, you know all of that. You know that whole history of what we dealt with while we were with you. And yet you know it didn't stop us. We had boldness in our God to keep preaching. In many ways, what Paul's doing, because they had to so abruptly and probably in an unplanned way leave town, and because he keeps trying to get back, but different circumstances have kept him from getting back, A huge part of the purpose of this letter is to address that distance. The elephant of the room, where'd Paul go? Why isn't he here? Let me explain why I left and why we haven't come back yet. I think Paul knew, like many of us have learned over the last few years, that when there's prolonged distance between people, it causes tension in relationships, right? Like we have that saying in our culture of absence makes the heart grow fonder. 
But if we've learned anything over the last few years, we've learned that that's not always or even usually true. More often than not, prolonged absence between people, gosh, it makes the heart grow not fonder, but insecure, apprehensive, suspicious, maybe even a little cynical. Questions start to creep into our mind about those people that we don't see anymore. Why, why did they leave? Why is there this distance between us? Why don't we hear from them that much anymore? Did we do something? Are they really who we thought they were when we were with them? Was that affection and closeness that we shared, was it, was it real or was it just the product of convenience? Was there something that that person wanted from me or from us? Was there some unspoken expectation that we didn't meet and that's why the relationship fell apart? I wonder if we saw them again, would it be the same? Would we be able to pick up where we left off or will the distance prove that we've actually drifted apart? Do you resonate with any of those questions? Have you wrestled with that at all in any of your relationship over the last couple of years with some of the distance and absence put in place by, by the circumstances around the pandemic? I mean, maybe you felt like that about people you don't see anymore. Heck, maybe you felt that way about me and the rest of the elders and pastors. Like, what are, what are they doing? Maybe especially during that time when we were relegated to have to do so much online. I resonate so much with this passage because I feel like that's so much of what I've wrestled with in my own life, in my family's life, of relationships over the last couple of years that have been strained by distance and by difficulty and by lack of communication. And the reality is for some of those relationships, it really did bring to light the fact that, yeah, we, we, we are moving in different directions now, even some literally moving to different locations. In other relationships, there's really been sweet reunions. There's been a time to kind of come back together. And almost like Paul does here, remember? Remember what we had? Remember? It wasn't fake. Oh man, there really was just kind of a weird fog of war that came in where it was hard for me to understand your intentions and my motivations and vice versa. Wow, we could sit down together and say, hey, what did you mean when you said that? What did, why didn't you do this? Why didn't we hear from you there? And like come to that point of, oh my gosh. Hey, I see. We didn't do it perfectly. But yeah, actually, we, we can have this place to both address how we missed each other and how we misunderstood each other. Relationships in my life that I do feel like right now are stronger than they were before the pandemic because in some ways of the difficulty, right? The bottom line is I think, I think we can all relate to that in certain ways. And I think Paul related to it too. I think this letter that he writes to the Thessalonians is as much for his own heart as it is for the Thessalonians' benefit. I think that's why he starts out in chapter one. He says, guys, this is, remember what I saw in you? It was real, it was true. Remember what you saw in me and in Silas and in Timothy? And so he begins to unpack for me. He says, let me, let me just clarify for you in the, the, the distance of the time, as you look back on the past, let me clarify for you, especially what was motivating us. And in the rest of this passage, he goes into great detail on their motivations. Both, this is what wasn't motivating us. Here's what we were not after as we interacted with you. And here's what did drive us. And he actually starts with the negative first. So if you will, take a look with me. Actually, one thing I wanna talk about first before I do that. Back here again in, in, in verses one and two, there's this key word, that Paul uses, this idea that they had boldness in God to declare the gospel. I want you to hold that word boldness in your mind as we go forward. Like pause for a second right now, close your eyes if it helps, or if you're taking notes, feel free to jot it down. Play a little word association game. When you think about that word boldness, what other words come up that help you describe what boldness looks like, what it means to be bold? What kind of people come to mind when you think of someone who is bold? What type of leaders demonstrate boldness, public figures and so forth? Can you think of any circumstances in your life, times where you went, I need to act with boldness right now? And then what did that look like? What did you say? What did you do? How did you treat others in that boldness? So take a moment, think through, okay, what, what do I think boldness looks like? What, what faces, what, what circumstances do I put in mind on that? And I, what I want you to do is I want you to hold all that kind of in one category in your mind. And now let's take a look at how Paul in this passage describes what boldness looked like in his ministry. 
and see how much it fits with or maybe even challenges the way that you typically think about boldness. Take a look at this, chapter two, verse three. First off, when you want to understand our boldness, you need to understand what was not motivating us. We did not, our appeal to you, our presentation of the gospel did not spring from error or impurity or any attempt to deceive. We didn't come in because we were totally convinced of what we were saying to you and then all of a sudden had this realization, oh my gosh, this is a bunch of hogwash. We better leave town because we're too embarrassed to acknowledge that we were wrong. That's not why we left, right? There was no impure motives. There wasn't some other underhanded thing that we were after in the way that we preached the gospel to you. We weren't driven by an attempt to deceive you. Again, either by trying to, get you to sell you a bill of goods that we didn't believe in ourselves. We weren't trying to deceive you with our message. I don't think they, in the same way, we also weren't trying to deceive you with the way we carried ourselves. We weren't trying to be one way in public and then something different in private. What you saw with us is the reality of who we were. But then he says this, we weren't trying to deceive you, but just as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, so we speak not to please man, but to please God who tests our hearts. He says, the reason why we came in boldly was because we know that we didn't take this ministry on for ourselves. God had called us to this. He approved us and entrusted us with the gospel. That's why we spoke. And he speaks in this way of a past thing. God has in the past approved us. We stand in the approval of God for the ministry that we have to bring the gospel where it's never been before. That was God's calling upon Paul's life to be this apostle to the Gentiles. And he says, that's why I'm doing this. But it's also not just something, oh yeah, I've got the, the degree up on my wall of when I was approved and now I just do what I want. He's not operating like some tenured professor where he goes, I've got job security and now I can just mail it in. He says, not only has God approved us in the past, he says God is the one who continues to test our hearts. Throughout this passage, he keeps triangulating his relationship with the Thessalonians. Not just the horizontal dimension of here's our relationship with each other, but remember God's at the center of all of this. God it proved us to carry this gospel to you. We were seeking to please him in the way we preached it to you. But think for a second about that phrase where he says that we spoke not to please man, but to please God. We could take that in the wrong way, couldn't we? I don't care what you think about me. You know what? I don't, I could... I don't care at all what you think of my message or my approach or my methods. I am just, look... Only God can judge me. We need to make sure we understand when Paul says he wasn't driven by pleasing man, but by pleasing God, this was not licensed to be a biblically accurate jerk. To beat people over the head with God's word. To say, hey, God says it. You got a problem with that? Take it up with him. Like we see, and we'll see even later in this passage, Paul deeply cared about the people that he reached. He deeply cared about the people that he preached the gospel to and discipled. And yet he also wasn't fundamentally driven by the desire for their pleasure, for their approval. We see throughout the book of Acts that Paul was a very careful observer of culture. He would come into different towns. He would listen carefully. What are the hopes and fears and concerns? What are the values of these people? How do I speak the gospel into that? He didn't have just one canned gospel presentation but he knew how to take the same message of hope in Jesus through his death and resurrection and craft it to hit people right where they needed to hear it. Not hide the parts of the gospel that he knew would be embarrassing or challenging, but be winsome, be considerate. And yet, for all of that consideration and skill and like precision strike sort of, let me speak God's truth right to your heart, what was often the result of Paul's preaching? What was that? imprisonment, suffering, persecution. On the one hand, he's going, look, if our job was to please people, we were doing a pretty lousy job of it. But we weren't driven by that. He's answering the question, why were, why were we bold? Why did we keep preaching the gospel in the midst of much conflict? Well, first off, he says, because our boldness there in verse two is in God. It was from him. He emboldened us. He is the one that we were seeking to serve he was the one whose approval we wanted. Our boldness came from God. And because our main goal was never to please people, but to please him. 
That's why we could keep going. He's not be, talking about being hard and uncaring and insensitive. He's actually talking about the boldness that enabled him to keep caring, even for the people who mistreated him. That's the boldness that Paul's talking about. A boldness without bitterness. A boldness that leads to these two things. There's one thing um, that has been a big thing my wife and I have talked about a lot over the last couple of years. It's this, these, these dual traits that we want to grow in. We want to have soft hearts and thick skin. And that's what I see in Paul in this passage. He goes, I want to have a thick skin so that I'm able to endure under the difficulty and the hardship and even just the hurt and misunderstanding that comes. But in that thick skin, I want a soft heart. I want to care deeply about people. How do you do that? With a boldness, a courage that comes from God that allows you to care and keep going. I think in the back of all of this, Paul knows, how, how can you endure and still love those who are violently opposed to your message? Because Paul knew firsthand that violent opponents to the gospel can still change. God can still open their eyes just like God had done with him on the road to Damascus. And so he was bold and courageous and caring in the face of that adversity. Take a look with me at verse five. He says, for we never came with words of flattery. We weren't trying to butter you up. We weren't trying to get something from you. As you know, nor with a pretext for greed. We didn't want your money. God's witness. Again, in that, in that time, let's triangulate the relationship. In the time that we've been apart, if you've started to doubt our motives, don't just take our word for it. Go to God who holds us together. Say, God, I'm struggling, trusting that Paul really had my best interests at heart. Paul said, Exactly. Go to him. He's the witness between us. He's the one whose approval we're seeking. Like, go to him on this. Help bring your concerns to him. Verse six, he says, nor did we seek glory from people, whether from you or from others. We weren't just after your esteem. We weren't just trying to raise our profile through you. This wasn't about patting our egos or using you guys as a launch pad to some bigger and better ministry somewhere else. Hey, look what I did with Thessalonica. Watch what I can do in your town. You saw the way that our preaching seldom brought us glory, more often brought us pain and embarrassment like what we suffered in Philippi. And so you know, if what we were really trying to do was gain glory, again, we were doing a pretty lousy job of it, at least if it was glory from you. Verse six, at the end of it, he says, actually, out of everything I've said we didn't do, here's one thing that we could have done. We could have made demands as apostles of Christ. I think he says they could have done that, not because it would have been right, but I think because it would have made sense to the Thessalonians. They were used to people coming in and flashing their credentials. This is who I am. Here's my ID. Treat me appropriately. They were used to the traveling orators and philosophers who would come throughout the Roman Empire that were, their main skill was eloquence. Watch the way I can turn a phrase. Watch the way I can, I can wow you with the pleasurability of the words that come from my mouth. And as a matter of fact, do you want to see it? Here's the fee. Pay up front. Paul's like, we could have come in with like a writer for our evangelistic campaign. If you want us to come in and do our ministry in your town, here's the things we need on the front end. We could have made those demands. That would have made sense to you. But it would have been totally out of step with the lifestyle of Jesus. His art, we weren't driven by self-promotion or self-importance, even though you would have understood that. We were driven by a boldness that looked very different. And check this out. This is where he really gets to the heart of it. If you've checked out for a little bit, check in right now, because look at, look at this. this is, look what he says their boldness looked like in verse seven. We were gentle among you. A few minutes ago, when I asked you to play a little word association game with the word boldness. Okay, show of hands, complete honesty, how many of you guys did the word gentle pop in your head? Me either, not before studying this passage anyways. Gentleness. This is why Paul's writing to shift our perspectives. Things are not as they seem. We're used to the kick button, take names kind of boldness. The people who just come in and clean house and get stuff done. He says, no, you want to know what our boldness looked like? It looked like gentleness. Our boldness, he says, looked like a nursing mother taking care of her own children. Again, 
when I asked you to picture people who exemplify boldness, how many of you guys pictured a mother nursing a newborn? That's boldness. I didn't before studying this passage, but you know who maybe thought of boldness in this regard? A mother who's currently nursing a newborn (laughs) that has a newborn at home. Or maybe some of you mothers who remember the intimidation of that first baby. The intimidation as the sun goes down, you go, oh my gosh, it's gonna be another night in which I don't know if I'm gonna get any sleep. I'm gonna have to do, I don't know how many feedings. When Paul says later on, he says, we were affectionately desirous of you. We loved you. We were ready to share with you not just the message of the gospel, but our own selves. You go, yes, I know what that feels like. For 10 months to have this share my own self with this child that is growing and developing inside you. All of the energy and nutrients come from me. And then even after that baby is born, you know the self-giving, the emptying of your own self for the sake of your child doesn't stop there. There is so much self-giving, self-emptyingness in motherhood. There's so much boldness in the relentless gentleness of a mom who gets up again at that cry at three in the morning, even though she goes, I don't know how I'm gonna do this. I think this is why Paul as a single man with no children of his own, could look at the image of a nursing mother and go, that's bold. That's courageous. That's what I wanna be like as a maker of disciples. I wanna be willing to sacrifice myself and pour myself out in order to see people come to new life in Jesus and then get established in that new life in Jesus. Help them thrive I want to be like a nursing mom. That's what I tried to show you when I was with you. Look at verse nine. He goes on and he says, for you remember, brothers, our labor and toil. We worked night and day. Most commentators think when he's talking about labor and toil, he's actually talking about actual physical work. We know from the book of Acts that that Paul was a a tent maker or a leather worker. He, He had a skilled trade that was needed in every community like an electrician or a plumber, or I guess you could say even like an IT technician in our day. Wherever you go, you know there's gonna be work for you because everybody needs those things. And so in whatever town Paul could go to, there was work that he could do to provide for himself and his companions. And so he says, we worked night and day. Why? So that we would not be a burden to any of you while we proclaim to you the gospel of God. He says, we were working while we proclaimed the gospel. You know what that probably means? The majority of Paul's preaching and evangelism and discipleship didn't happen in settings like this. We know from Acts that he would go to the synagogue on the Sabbath day and speak to the Jews perhaps in a gathered setting like this. But most of his work happened on the job. Perhaps with the people who were engaged in the same trade around him, the people, the client, the, the, the customers that would come in for work. Perhaps as the church was established, the new believers, they'd come, hey, Paul, I want to know more about what it means to follow Jesus. Okay, come to work with me tomorrow. We'll help put this thing together for this dude down the street who ordered this cool leather thing. And then we'll talk about Jesus along the way. It was an as he went along kind of ministry that he had, which might sound more approachable, right? I mean, what what does this look for you? If you're a follower of Jesus in your workplace, perhaps you already go, yes, I see that. I resonate with that. That's what drives me in my workplace. I wanna be good at my work and diligent at my work because I also wanna care about the people that I work with. I recognize I represent Jesus there. So I seek to show my employees that they just don't, or the people that I work with, they don't just happen to be here in the same spot as me. I care about them. And even if in my line of work, it's kind of iffy to have too many deep conversations in the midst of work, that's why I care about the people I work with outside of work. I seek to build those relationships because I want to see people reached with the gospel. But again, I love, again, think of this imagery of a parent. He already said, we were like nursing mothers with you. And he says, we worked night and day. Why? So that we wouldn't be a burden to you. If you're a parent in here, you can resonate with that desire, right? Like parenthood in many ways is a burden. There is weight to carry with it, to, to provide and protect and teach and guide our kids. It, it is a burden and, that, and that's okay. That's a good thing. I mean, that's what we signed up for, whether we knew it or not. That's our job. But kind of like Paul says here, like the, the parent-child relationship is very purposefully imbalanced, 
There are ways in which we as parents want to care for the burdens and bear the burdens of our kids, but we want to be sensitive. We don't want to put more weight on our kids than their age or their strength or maturity is, is able to bear. We want to bear their burdens. We don't want to expect them to bear ours. Now, again, as kids grow and mature, they're able to take on more responsibility. They're able to hand more, handle more burdens on their own. And eventually, you know, down the road, the parent-child relationship, the balance of it totally flips the other way. As parents age, and then they need their adult children to take care of them. As a matter of fact, Paul talks about that elsewhere, like in 1 Timothy. He says, it's time now for adult children to make some return to their parents by bearing their burden now in their old age. But that's kind of the point, right? That, that speaks to the end goal of parenting, Wanting to see our children grow to maturity is not just so that they can fend for themselves and be independent on their own, but see them mature to the point where they willingly choose to bear the burdens of others, care for others. That's something with the ages our kids are at right now, kind of that upper elementary, early uh, teenage years that we talk about pretty often in our home. That maturity is not just about being able to handle your own stuff, take care of yourself, but willingly choosing to take care of others. That's what my wife and I seek to model imperfectly in the way we walk with them because we want to have our eye to that horizon, not just that we want to enjoy the ages that our kids are at right now and not be in a hurry. I love how some of you guys who are older parents have been like that in our lives. Enjoy every day, it goes fast. As people have often said, the, the uh, days are long, but the years are short. And I feel that right now. But I want my perspective as a parent to be shaped not just by where my kids are at right now, but by the men and women that I already see them becoming. I think that's what drove Paul in the way he interacted with the Thessalonians. Not just with an eye to where they were right now, but where they were heading. Take a look with me at verse 10. He says, your witnesses in God also how holy and righteous and blameless was our conduct toward you believers. We'll get more, and especially into that idea of holiness later. Paul goes into a lot more idea about holiness in chapter four. But again, Paul's point here is you saw we were the real deal. We were talking about this in sermon prep this week, and actually Thomas Shearer, he made this great point where he says, I look at this whole passage and I just see messengers who were shaped by the message that they proclaimed. That Paul and Silas and Timothy were shaped and transformed by the very gospel that they proclaimed to others. And that's what he's saying here. You saw our lives were transformed by this and that's what we want for you too. Not just to hear and believe this message, but for you to be shaped by the message and to be messengers to others as well. And so he says in verse 11, he kind of flips the metaphor around now and he says, for you know how like a father with his children, we exhorted each one of you and encouraged you and charged you to walk in a manner worthy of God who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. Back in verse seven, he says, we were like nursing mothers with you. And then here in verse 11, he says, we were like fathers, exhorting, encouraging, charging you to walk in a manner worthy of God. Do you, do you see kind of the growth, the, the, the maturing going on in the way he walked with people? When you first came to faith, we were that nursing mom who said, I'm not gonna expect a lot from you. I'm just gonna pour myself into you to see you established in this new life. But as you grow, I'm training you for maturity. I'm training you to be one who can bear the burdens of others just like we've been bearing your burden. So I wanna encourage you and exhort you and charge you and instruct you about who you're becoming. Walk in a manner worthy of the Lord. And he says, we did this with each one of you. Not just group organization, group communication, but again, person by person, like a father. As, a, as with four kids myself, there are those times where it is group management. And there's that time where it's one-on-one -on -one parenting. And sometimes those two things are hard to balance. But again, this is just so cool. You see this dude saying, however long we were with you, you saw we weren't just about gathering a group and gathering and, and being able to show, see how many names on my list? We walked with each one of you. This passage makes it so clear that Paul and his companions were not just about making converts, getting people to believe this message and then leave them to themselves from there. They were about making disciples, people who were learning from Jesus, 
and trusting Jesus, becoming like Jesus and helping others to do the same. People who could not only take care of themselves but take care of others. He wanted to see the Thessalonians shaped by the message that had shaped him. And that's why he's so excited in chapter one. Even though we had to leave, we saw that starting to happen in you. We saw you growing in this new life and everything we've heard about you since then has only excited us more and more. Do you see throughout this letter, Paul is writing like a totally unashamed, proud parent. I am so excited by what I see you you doing. I see you following Jesus. But think about this for a moment. Paul, Silas, and Timothy, the three guys that are addressed as the authors in this letter, as far as we can tell, they were all single, childless men. How many single, childless men do you know who so freely speak of themselves in parental terms, right? We were like nursing moms. We were like dads with you. They so freely use family language. You might have caught it, but twice in this passage, Paul refers to the Thessalonians as brothers or or brothers and sisters. The, The term kind of encompasses both the men and the women in the group. 18 times in this short letter, he calls them brothers. And the point I think we need to wrap our minds around is this. These weren't just metaphors for Paul and Silas and Timothy. They didn't just think that the church was like a family or should be like a family. They believed that the church is a family. Through their shared faith in Jesus, this is why he introduces God in the very first verse of the book as God the Father, our shared Father. Through our faith in Jesus, we have all been adopted into this new family. Remember, the point of this letter, reshape our perspectives. Help us see things in a new life. And that includes the way that we think about family. That's why he keeps calling them brothers and sisters. Not just like a hey bro kind of a thing or like a term of affection, but as the most appropriate term to reflect the reality of the relationship that they now share in God together. In many ways, everything that Paul's doing here just echoes the way that Jesus himself flipped the perspective of family during his own ministry. Take a look at this. Mark chapter three. Early on in Jesus' ministry, his mother and brothers don't know what to do with him. They think he's out of his mind, so they go to the town where Jesus is preaching to basically just say, come with us, simmer down. (laughs) You're causing too much heat. And so the crowd's sitting with him. They say, hey, your mother and brothers are outside seeking you. And he answered them, who? Who are my mother and my brothers? And then looking about at those who sat with him, he said, here are my mother and my brothers. For whoever does God's will is my mother and my sister and my brother. He's reshaping this idea. Family of faith is not just a handy metaphor. It's the reality of the theological reality of our adoption as children of God. Later on, in the classic story of the rich young man who comes to Jesus, what must I do to be saved? Well, you know the commandments. Yeah, yeah, I've kept all those. Okay, one thing you lack, sell what you have and come follow me. And he can't do that and he walks away and Jesus makes that statement, how hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of heaven. It's so hard to let go of what you have to realize what you can have in Christ. And in response to that, Peter goes, well, Lord, what about us? We left everything to follow you. And look what Jesus says later on in Mark 10. Truly I say to you, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or lands for my sake and for the gospel who will not receive a hundredfold now in this time houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and lands with persecutions. That's part of the deal. It's a package deal. You can't separate it out. And in the age to come, eternal life. Paul is just reflecting these ideas that Jesus brought when he writes to the Thessalonians. I know when the gospel came and you believed, it brought tension. Some of you have been disowned by your families. You don't fit with your culture anymore. You're patriotic countrymen. You don't fit with them anymore because you're not as woo Caesar as they are. 
And I get that that feels really isolating. And what Paul's doing here is he's not just saying, hey, we got like a replacement family for you. This isn't just like some consolation prize on a TV game show where it's like, oh, sorry, that was not the right, not the right answer. You miss out on the vacation to Hawaii, but here's a toaster as you leave. <laughs> it's not some cheesy little replacement. He's not overlooking what they've lost. He's trying to give them new perspective of what they've gained. Here's what you have now in Jesus. And again, I think this is very personal for Paul. He writes at length in Philippians about all that he used to have, the sense of belonging and status and inclusion in the people of Israel, and he lost all of it through faith in Jesus and found something so much more that he says, you know what? I wouldn't want that back if I had the choice. I have found something so much more precious in Jesus. Paul, as an unmarried, childless man, was absolutely a family man. He was devoted to the family of God. He poured himself out like a nursing mother to bring new life to those who believed. He encouraged them in the faith like a father, training them toward maturity. He absolutely obeyed the command that God gave to Adam and Eve way back in the beginning to be fruitful and multiply. Not through physical offspring, but through making disciples. Paul had no biological family but yet he had found something even more lasting and real and eternal in the family of God. Do you believe that? Do you believe that the gospel of Jesus takes this fundamental idea of family, which is the starting point for so much of us in the way that we understand ourselves and our place in this world, and he says even that very idea of family gets reoriented around Jesus, reoriented around what it means to be now part of this family. The whole idea of family gets shined in a new light through what Jesus does. In some ways, it's similar to what maybe some of you might be more familiar with in Ephesians chapter five with what Paul says about marriage. Husbands, love your wives like Christ loved the church. Wives, submit to your husbands like the church submits to Christ. Why? Because actually, marriage from the very beginning has always been about finding its fulfillment in the relationship between Jesus and his people. So when God says back in Genesis 2 that the man will leave his father and mother and the two shall become one flesh, I'm telling you that that mysterious one flesh reality, it's actually about Jesus and the church. So if you're married in here, reorient your marriage to point to the eternal marriage between Jesus and his people. If you're unmarried or widowed in this room and you're a follower of Jesus, you are already included in the ultimate marriage that all human marriages are meant to point you. You're not lacking anything. And in the same way here in 1 Thessalonians, what Paul's saying is he's saying, look, whether you're married or single or widowed or childless or you have more kids than you know what to do with, whether you're part of a blended family, your foster parents, your grandparents, your empty nesters, if you are in Christ, you are already a part of the ultimate reality that family has always been pointing to. When God promised Abraham back in Genesis 12 that he would make his family into a great nation to ultimately bless all the families of the earth through him, this is what, Paul, this is what God was talking about with Abraham. The family that God our Father has been building from, from the very beginning, the ultimate blended family made up of people from every tribe and tongue and language and nation gathered together forever as God's children. Reshape your perspective on your family around that. Organize your family to point to the ultimate family. Church is not just a good thing for your family to be involved in. Church is family. Do we always love each other well like family? No. We have a lot of room to grow. This passage has been intimidating to study because, to be honest, over the last couple of years, I, I have more of a desire than ever before to hedge my bets. I don't know if I definitely want to entrust myself and my family completely to my family in Christ because I know it's messy and I know it's hard. And yet I can't deny what I see here in the text. 
I can't deny that what is good in my family is meant to whet my appetite for the reality of what is good and beautiful and eternal about the family of God. I think about what is broken in my family, what is broken in our family as a local church is to show us our need for redemption and reconciliation in the family of God. And the last thing that Paul says here in verse 12, remember who this family is. Remember who this God is who calls us as children. He's the God who calls us into his own kingdom and glory. This family that we're included into, it's a royal family. We're kids of the king of kings. That's something that's true now and will be totally true in the future. By virtue of Jesus' death and resurrection, he reigns as king right now. And yet we hang on the promise that one day Jesus will return and bring the fullness of his kingdom to earth as it is in heaven. Paul talks a lot more about that later in this letter and in the next one. But the point is that just as Paul is reframing our perspective on family, He's reflaming our perspective on what it means to be a kingdom. Whatever family you were born into, however good or broken it was, if you're in Christ, you are part of a new family. Whatever nation you were born into, whatever nation you immigrated into, regardless of who currently sits on the thrones or in the offices of power in whatever nation it is, if you are in Jesus Christ, your citizenship, your identity is already rooted in the kingdom of God. And now in whatever city or nation or family in which we live, we live as representatives of the king, as kids of the king who get to show people a taste of the goodness of our king. That's a huge Huge calling. That's a reality we will be forever, or at least in this life, growing up into. Learning through success and failure what it means to be God's kids, to be brothers and sisters together, to be ambassadors of Jesus the King. And it's only done in dependence upon the Holy Spirit. But again, as we see in this passage, it starts with this reorienting of our perspectives of which family we find our identity in and devote ourselves to? Are we willing to learn to truly devote ourselves to one another as brothers and sisters, to love one another like the forever family that we are? Are we willing to have our perspective on kingdom reshaped, to learn to devote ourselves and find our identity in Jesus and his kingdom, and then serve our king in the way that we serve those around us? Are we willing to have our perspective on boldness changed? not to be pushy or flashy flashy or bossy and definitely not whiny, but a gentle, sacrificial surface, a boldness that leads us to have soft hearts and thick skin, to embrace our calling to be mothers and fathers who pour our lives out to see more disciples trained and grown. Boldness looks like people who are willing, honestly willing to follow in the footsteps of Jesus. It's intimidating, but man, that's where God's calling us and we need his courage, his boldness to do that. Would you pray with me? And we'll sing one more song together. (sighs) Jesus, thank you for the way this passage has challenged me this week. Lord, I confess to you that within this family, there are people that are easy to love as brothers and sisters and there are some that are less so. I know that I fit in both of those categories for many people in this room as well. But thank you, Lord, that I don't define this family. Thank you, Lord, that that our faithfulness to each other does not define this family. It is your faithfulness to us. It is your call of adoption on our lives. You, our Father, who calls us to your own kingdom and glory. Lord, would you give us bold gentleness to grow as a family, as a kingdom, to represent you well here in Simi Valley and around the world, Lord. We ask this in your name. Amen.